Good to get started? Yeah, I think we're, we're good to go. Excellent. All right. Well, thank you everyone for joining us and, and to those who are joining us uh, online remotely. Uh, welcome to the uh, China Seminar Series hosted by the Australia National University and the ANU Center for China and the World, which is where we are today. Uh, before introducing our speaker, I'd just like to do uh, to a quick acknowledgement of country. Uh, we are, you know, of course, on unceded uh, First Nations lands. Our hosts are the Nambri and Ngunnawal peoples, and we pay our respects to our elders past, present, and emerging. So just a little bit about our speaker today, Christopher Chung. Uh, who began his studies in Brisbane in architecture, and much like myself, beginning in something completely different and finding his way to a very fascinating and very complex topic today, which we'll be exploring a little bit further. Uh, he is, of course, joining us having studied uh, at Sun Yat-sen University in Guangzhou, as well as China's Chinese University of Hong Kong, CUHK in, uh, in Hong Kong, and is now uh, currently affiliated with the China-Australia Heritage Corridor, Western, 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 Western Sydney University. Perfect. So it is my great pleasure on behalf of, of the CIW and behalf of the China Seminar Series to welcome Christopher Chung today for an excellent talk. So thank you so much. The floor is yours, sir. I acknowledge the traditional owners on the land on which we are gathered today, the elders past and present. I especially acknowledge the um, members of the stolen generation who may never find their way back home. It is through my studies on Chinese in Australia that I also discovered those who lived through the white Australia era and they became lost souls, disconnected with their culture and heritage. And this, it is this intergenerational connection to place that I'm looking at in my talk today. The Cantonese, um, the Cantonese um, plays a very important connection to place. Um, they identify themselves as Tongyan, or the people of the Tang Dynasty, and they were settled in southern China for over a thousand years. And if we compare that to British colonization of Australia, um, the Cantonese in southern China are five times as long as what we have here in Australia. My research um, seeks to impart this knowledge of the immigrant generation onto the descendants of, of migrants, because I want to say that they belong to more than one world. I would like to thank ANU, China in the World, for hosting this session today. For the past week, I've been in Canberra and enjoying all this, all the um, resources that this city has to offer. I'm visiting the National Library on a daily basis. And if I'm not at the library, I'm on my way there. I've waited for this opportunity for more than two years, and we all know why. Today, I would like to thank many people, especially research participants, some of which are in the audience, like Howard, and others who are online, joining me from all over the world. And as a Chinese thing, to, as a Chinese thing I would like to also acknowledge my teachers, and Jocelyn Shea, Michael Williams, Dennis Byrne, Ian Ang, at all at the Western Sydney University. And I would like to thank all of you for taking the time to be with me today. Before I go any further, I would like to ask my audience. I've got a few questions for you. First, who are you? Why did you come to my talk today? What do you know about my topic? And how much do you know? I'd like a few answers. Hi, Chris. My name's Howard Wilson. I've been working with Chris on some of this stuff that he'll be talking about today. He'll be talking about a village in uh, South China. And uh, that's the, where the school that he'll, that he'll, I'm sure he'll mention. Uh, that school was founded by 
my wife's grandfather. And uh, the village was lost for a long time to the family because of the Cultural Revolution and the, the threat that the family would face it by being running dog capitalists. <laughs> and uh, so they didn't keep in touch with the village. And it was a long time, well, with another one of our friends, Kate Bagnall and Sophie Couchman, we all discovered that. But, uh, well, we, we thought that we discovered it, but we, Kate, Kate and, and Sophie's tours to South China, to Zonto, um, discovered that village and, and, and gave rise to uh, to uh, redevelopment and you know, restitution and reconstruction of that village. So that's my, I'm really interested. I'm, I'm involved. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Howard. Um, any... Can't hear. Can you speak a bit louder, please? Yep. Um, uh, what's your name? Yeah. Yuan. Yuan was talking about like um, she's a Chinese um, person, but in the future she may become a Chinese Australian, and she's contemplating about an identity crisis in the future that um, the children may have, not knowing whether they're Chinese or Australian. Hmm. Thank you. Yep. It looks like we have a diverse range of people in the audience. And um, if for whatever reason I fall asleep, I think Howard can take over my talk. <laughs> okay, now, now I'll um, continue. First, I'd like to talk to you about my life before PhD. As Duane was saying that I was um, facing an identity crisis. I had grown up as a first generation Chinese in Australia, uh, first generation Australian. My parents were um, migrants from Hong Kong. They spoke only Cantonese at home. We ate Cantonese food, and I felt my life was quite different to people around me. This difference was something of made me feel that I didn't belong here. I was. And um, this feeling was most um, strongly felt when I was in university and I went with my professor, uh, a tutor to Outback Australia and we um, explored um, the Aboriginal settlement and places. I met Aboriginal families who knew their country and knew their place in the world very intimately and their knowledge and my lack of knowledge be, being a, a newcomer into this strange land, I felt that I wanted to be more connected. I had always felt that I was Chinese in Australia, but I didn't really know what being Chinese meant. And this prompted me to go overseas to Hong Kong, where my family were and where my parents were before they came to Australia. When I was in Hong Kong and China, an interesting thing happened. People started calling me Oh Zhao Jai, which um, in Cantonese means Australian lad. These were people who couldn't speak English, so they had to come up with a name to call me. But those who could speak English, they were fascinated with my Australian accent. They were used to hearing British an American accent, but they knew less people who spoke Australian.
It was during my time in Hong Kong that I was able to meet my uncle who was in Cairns. He brought his family back to the village. Um, it's exploring um, Bon Lam Sha in Guangdong. Uh, my uncle brought his family back to the village. And in the village in um, Zhongshan, this is Wanxing, um, part of South District, he was pointing out different houses. Oh, this belongs to such and such in Cairns. This person is from Townsville. And I was fascinated. I was actually um, seeing that there were Australian connections in the village in Southern China. But where he spent the most time during our visit was at his old school. This is um, Juxaoyin School, one of his primary schools. He was telling me memories of his childhood there. This trip in 2016, a year before my PhD, was actually a spark. Later on in that year, I joined a colleague of mine from South China Research Center, Francis Lowe, and we went on a Homeland Heritage Discovery Tour. This is one of the photos um, taken in Harmon, Shaman. Um, and on that trip, after um, on that trip, I saw a lot of um, overseas Chinese heritage. One thing that um, I came away from that trip was a feeling of um, being quite devastated that the future of this heritage, um, some of it was in um, a poor condition and it may not survive into the future. And this idea of um, the heritage being in a state, in a dismal state, um, made me think heritage is not of the past, but it's something that we should protect for the future. Later on in that year, that eventful 2016, I met up with a few people that also led me along this path to Zhongshan and my PhD. First, it was meeting Michael Williams, a historian from Australia who was in Hong Kong uh, for, a, um, for a conference. He, had taught, um, he introduced me to a project called the China-Australian Heritage Corridor. And it's a project that um, is a project that we recently finished last year. This project is about the two-way flow from Australia to China and China to Australia of people, ideas, and also the built heritage. Other people that I were in contact with that year was um, Julia Bodmore and um, from Cairns. She's a researcher doing um, a history of Papua and Andrew Leon. Andrew is a, a pioneer of the Cairns community. Um, he, he was one of the earliest settlers. And his Hapwa um, plantation is a sh sugar plantation that um, was one of the largest of that time. What Julie wanted me to do was help her identify the village where Andrew was from and also where um, Andrew's son, William, was sent to. He was sent to and never returned. And in our correspondence, um, Julie introduced me to her friend, Janet Liu Terry, who was traveling to Hong Kong and she would meet me. Janet would, um, would tell me about her own research and that she was advocating for more research on Chinese, uh, on Australian history done in China. She had told me about a paper she presented at a Dragon Towers conference in 2015, and um, which she entitled Through the Brick Wall and Into a Garden of Infinite Delight. Around the same time as I was receiving um, guests from Australia, I was also receiving um, 
information from China. My cousin, Andy Wong, he has sent me a photo of a new uh, proposal for an overseas Chinese museum in Zhongshan. And then this is the museum um, which was finished last year. So this news coming from Australia and also from China itself prompted me that um, there was important research to be done and that I should come back to Australia to continue this research. And Jungsan also happened to be the place where my father was from. So it connected with my family history. For those who don't know, Jungsan is on the Western side of the Pearl River Delta. It's named after Dr. Sun Yat-sen. And it's also in this region that the first diaspora funded school um, was founded in China. And the Chinese Australian connection is most famous for um, the, the big four department stores. They began as fruit stores and traders in Sydney and they expanded to um, Hong Kong, Canton and um, Shanghai as department stores. But behind their success, little is known about their philanthropic deeds, especially what they did in the village. So how did I study diaspora funded schools in Cantonese Kilgun Hoha? In Jongsan, the sort of materials that are available or most accessible um, is this Wa Kilji. And in it, and other um, volumes like it, there, there were a lot of dry facts, like who built, the names of the people who built the schools, what year they were built, the size of the schools, the materials, but little is known about the first generation motivation, the desires and the meanings of the schools for descendants over time. So in my study, I had to synthesize Chinese and English materials, do um, on-site field work, and following the advice of the late Henry Chan, um, an ad adaptive approach of having an ethnographic eyes and sinological ears, which is listening to the Chinese descendants and also um, keeping my eyes open. Very early on in my research, I received a very disturbing photo from a Facebook friend that I recently met in Sydney. Let's do my research. This, after receiving this photo, it made me rethink that I also need to adopt a very inclusive approach that was sensitive to the change of the school over time. Now I'll look at why are diaspora funded schools a part of Chinese Australian heritage. and pay for the meal, do we ever think where our money is going? Some of it may keep the business going. We're much larger and more elaborate. They were, in the words of my supervisor, dream houses. And I noticed that in every village that had a migrant population, there was a school, or they had wanted one, at least. And Dennis wrote in his article, um, the schools had a central position in the village, and, and that spoke volumes about the significance of education in the region. Initially, schools were prompted by Chinese nationalism and also 
in Australia, exclusion, um, racist and exclusion. Chinese newspapers and Chinese magazines directed at overseas Chinese known as Kiu Hong facilitated donations, nurturing existing ties that already existed um, with the hometown and overseas community. In the late 20th century, this sort of practice continued, especially after um, the schools remained inadequate um, after the Cultural Revolution. Deficiency continued to fuel the desire for more school building. And this was made apparent when people in the, when Chinese migrants in Australia couldn't read their children's report cards in English and they couldn't write letters home to their families in China. Traditionally in China, um, education was only reserved for those who had the money and um, boys, often poor or um, poor um, people from poor families or girls missed out. But overseas funds start to change the opportunities of what was available at home. And through the support of overseas Chinese contribution, um, schools were able to um, become a pride of the village. And each time families came back, they would bring with them sporting, musical, and other sort of donations to equip the school. So when we're driving past a market garden or a Chinese restaurant, we need not think that it only nourishes our hunger, but it helps us to but it also helps to fulfill the potential of the children on the other side of the world. Still, less is known about the donors' lives because they tend not to boast about what they do. They're also quite busy with their day-to-day -day business. And often they experience cross-cultural intergeneration differences between the migrant generation and those born overseas. So in my research, I have been translating materials and working across, across countries to bridge this knowledge gap. One of my first findings was that the modern schools were an exhibition of the future. There were four main characteristics. First, it was bells. Second, stairs. Third, it was windows. Fourth is rooftop terraces. These new schools had bells and that created a new rhythm in the village where punctuality was something that was valued. A schoolboy wrote in a magazine that he was running to school when he heard the bell and he tripped. You can see that there was a new sort of um, expectation on time. And in terms of stairs, it was, it was exciting and it was also intimidating. Some students, they were afraid of um, going upstairs for the first time as they've never been inside a double story building in their life. Another modern, another modern feature of these schools were windows. If we remember, traditionally, ancestral halls of the past tended to be introvert, introverted buildings. They didn't have any windows. And inside the um, inside these modern classrooms, um, children 
could see further and wider than their ancestors could on a daily basis by just looking out the window. A fourth feature were the roof terraces. They were usually out of bounds in many schools, but on special days, such as Qingming, oh, oh, not Qingming, sorry, and the Mid-Autumn Festival, people, the family and the villagers would go on top of the roof and observe the um, moon. So we can see that these schools, they were rising above the past, and tradition and modernity was coming together, and the school was a step into that future. Another finding was that these old schools are living museums and a window into the past. The historian, Pierre Nora, coined a concept called Sites of Memory. These sites are stable points that give us a reference into the past. For descendants of migrants, schools were a place to learn about their family history. For example, my uncle, who's crouched out, who's crouched um, at the gates of Hungmei School, told us about his life in the 1960s. What was um, especially revealing to me was that he told me about my father, who only had a few years of primary school. He was saying that the class teacher told him and a few other classmates to stand up in class. And then they were interrogated. Why haven't you paid your school fees? He kept silent. And after that happened a few times, he ran away and never went back to school again. The headmaster also did the same thing to my grandfather. He would go to his shop, which was outside the school, and ask my grandfather, why haven't you paid your kids school fees? My grandfather would remain silent and um, using his saw, continue to work. So um, yeah, obviously I come from a very talkative household. But for donors, um, going back to the village was an opportunity to connect to their family. Um, for Stanley Hunt, he had named the main classroom block of his school after his father, Harry Hunt, um, and built a few years later, decided it was a library, which is named after his mother. Each time going back to the village, he would be paying tribute to his parents and remembering them. But for other um, Chinese Australians, going back to the village school was a discovery. Gary, Gary Leung, who sent me this photo, told me that each trip he was learning something new about his past. On this trip, he was telling me that he had learned that his father, who never told him, had do donated to the kindergarten in the village. And we can see a photo of his father here. And during our discussion, I actually told him something he didn't know, was that his grandfather had actually contributed to the school in which this photo was taken. His grandfather was associated with a business in Ingham called Hongyun. And this business, like many others in Australia, um, would send money back to Hong Kong through the gold mountain firms. And this was redirected to the school in Jongsan. And when the students graduate from the schools, some of them would end up migrating overseas and working in the businesses that initially supported the establishment of the school. So you can see there's a, um, a cycle happening here. 
But what happens when a school is no longer a school? So going back to On Tong, when I was in Zhongshan with fellow historian Sandy Rob, we were asking the villagers, what happened to the school? The villagers remained silent, shh, and they wouldn't tell us anything. And it was only a person in the neighboring village who um, dared to say what had happened and that there was a lot of internal conflict in the village about what had happened and poor decisions were made. And yeah, I better not say too much. <laughs> and in Australia, I met a descendant of a donor who I would call Amanda because she doesn't want to reveal her true identity. In our, in our interview, she asked me what happened to the schools in Jungsan. She had, she had ideas about what had happened, but she was also curious to know because she was also quite unsure. She had told me that her father had donated to a school in 1985. And because he was waiting for his um, residency and he was also busy working, he didn't have a chance to go back to the village until much later. When the family went back to the village, they were shocked that there was nobody there to greet them. And they felt quite alone in the village. Amanda's father was the youngest in the family. The parents had already died. All the, all the brothers and sisters had already died or immigrated elsewhere. So it seemed the village had moved on without them. And upon returning to Australia, they've since learned that the school was no longer a school and it was being used for something else. Still, this story tells us that Chinese Australians continue to care for what happened to these schools as it's part of our shared heritage. At another school, another village in Jungsan, there was a... In another village in Jungsan, um, Billy Lee told us about what had happened to his school. He had been in existence for less than 10 years. He had built it in the 1990s. And by the 2000s, the school was no more. He had heard it had become a factory. Like the others, he was quite devastated. When I was in Jungsan, I was talking to the, um, the Chinese Overseas Affairs officials, the Kilban, Chaoban. And they were saying that these, um, these schools were called Ma Jiu Ho Hao, which means they were very small schools. And as China's economy improved, the local government was able to build their own schools, which meant they had better facilities than what they were able to offer during the initial reform period. And and Nita Chan um, of this center um, wrote a book called The Chan Village. And in this book, um, we're informed that the children of Mao, as she described them, they ha hadn't cultivated many skills. And it was during this era when they became um, leaders of the village and they had no skills but to turn whatever assets they had into their own property. In the book, it describes um, mountains around the village being flattened to make room for factories. And in my case, um, there were schools being transformed into factories. This is an example. But as we've seen so far, a lot of these transitions are not permanent. Billy Lee was upset when he returned to his village 
and he saw that his school had become a factory. He talked to the officials, and then the next time he came back, he was happy to find that his school had been transformed into a kindergarten. And other schools in the other schools in Jongsan have become offices and museums. So what is the future of diaspora funded schools? In 2017, I heard about a new initiative happening in Zhuhai. And this uh, relates to a school built by um, James Choi Heng of the Sun Department Store. We can see the old school was established in the 1930s and three kilometers apart from it is a new school. The old school today, or when I last visited, was a warehouse where, where a stationery shop had um, stored it. Uh, it was used as a warehouse for a stationery shop. After the um, new school was established, the descendants and the family were in, invited back for um, its inauguration. And this was an opportunity to make the descendants, the new patrons and um, patrons of the school and the family continue to be involved in its development. Um, I heard from the family that James Choi Heng was a modest man, but he was also quite ambitious. And I think he wanted to be remembered. Why I say this is because his initial school, let me go back here, was not as high as it, it, as it is now. But when he was building it, he was, he, um, another building in the vicinity was um, going to compete with it in terms of height. So he put up an extra two floors to um, make it the tallest in the area. Another reason why I think he wanted to be remembered was that the name of the school is actually his nickname, Lai Wo. So in choosing this name, he wanted his legacy to be remembered. David Eagleman, who wrote the book Some, says people die three times. First, when their body ceases to function. Second, when they're consigned to a grave. Third, is sometime into the future when your name is spoken for the last time. So giving a school a new life, Choi Heng's name in all its permutations will live on into the future, lest we forget. Australian heritage. So in terms of Australian heritage, what comes to mind when you hear the term Australian heritage? Most of us would think of national heritage, nature or built heritage. But in how about overseas heritage? Anything that comes to mind? On the Australian Overseas Place of Historical Significance Register, um, we have places where Australia um, fought uh, during the World War, the First and Second World War. But what's missing from um, this heritage register so far are migration places. And the ne Nepalese professor, Ghassan Hajj, had asked, what's more Australian than the villages that Australians have come from? And in a similar, in a similar manner, Shirley Fitzgerald a historian 
of Sydney um, who visited Jungsan um, was outside these mansions that um, the Sydney fruit traders had built. And, and she wondered, whose heritage is it? it? It was built by money that was from Australia and ideas that had come from Australia. So how do we manage, how do we recognize and manage heritage that is outside Australia? In my thesis, I've shown that um, one way is to work with local communities and descendants of the donors in language in Australia and China. And then um, we could, in the future, um, come up with a management plan that involves stakeholders. Sometimes it would include trusted specialists like architects, historians, and those who are, um, have bilingual cap capabilities. And once common ground has been established, certificates can be issued to cement relationships and publicize these ongoing positive connections that have existed between Australia and China for the past century. Australian historians, Kate Durin Smith and Paula Hamilton noted in their 2013 article, Memory and History of in 21st Century Australia. Younger Australians who visit places of national significance overseas pay homage to the nation's past and acknowledge Australia's ongoing relationship with its present day neighbors. Apart from sustaining connections, having um, through people and people connections, having a history to refer to will also be useful. As part of my ANU Library Fellowship, I've been collecting materials from the National Library of Australia in hope of one day publishing my research into a book in English and in Chinese. I must say that throughout the period of my research, many of my participants have bombarded me with curious questions. We were both fascinated to know more about why these schools were initially built and how they were and what they had become over time. And during this process, we enriched each other's understanding I have shared with them relevant research materials that I've um, prepared. And if any one of you would like a copy of some of this material, feel free to email me. By sharing knowledge, we have more things in common and belong to a, and we start belonging to a larger group, which is not only Chinese or Australian, but a hyphenated identity, whether descendants in the future look Chinese or otherwise. In China, the current recognition of overseas Chinese heritage consists of Diulong and Kilpai. But I argue there is a third. And what is it? Diaspora-funded schools, Kilgun Ho Hao. They are arguably architecturally and socially as significant. They were built with the same state-of-the-art technology as the fortified watchtowers. And unlike, and now unlike them, um, schools were a product of collective rather than individual remittances. Over the course of their lifetime, schools mattered to more people 
in the village and overseas and for a longer period of time. Protecting this heritage will ensure that the children of the diaspora will continue to belong to two, uh, to at least two worlds as their pioneer, pioneering forebears once did. In the context of this research, Kevin Wong Hoy, whose article was published in Sophie Couchman's book, Secret Silences and Sources, points out that Chinese Australians are simultaneously on two journeys, one of becoming Australians, and another is a journey into an ancient culture of the Chinese past. In the future, I want children of migrants to feel better connected to two or more places in which they were inter inherently, I'll say that again. In the future, I want children of migrants to feel better connected to two or more places in which they inherently belong. Recognizing overseas heritage of migration is one step towards this grand but achievable vision of promoting multiculturalism. Now, it's time for your input. Since we know that migrants belong to more than one world, I'm keen to know, have you heard of other examples of significant overseas migrant heritage of Australia that exists elsewhere in the world? And more importantly, a tougher question, when and how should diaspora heritage be made better known as an additional category of transnational heritage? 